Stealing Focus! (laughs) Greetings, Broadway babies. I'm Emily. I'm Jeff. And welcome to Stealing Focus Interviews. This is the show where Jeff and I talk to people from the world of theater. So from Broadway, LA theater, the West End, and beyond. And today we have the incredible composer Ryan Scott Oliver with us. Yes, Ryan Scott Oliver is a composer and lyricist of musical theater, song cycles, cabaret works, concept albums, you name it, he's written it. And uh, his works have been performed across the world, including his off-Broadway musical Jasper and Deadland. And his songs have been performed by like so many Broadway people, you guys. It's like Megan Hilty, Jane Krakowski, Matt Doyle, Jay Armstrong Johnson, Leslie Margarita, Alex Brightman, and Lindsay Mendez, just to name a few. Can you believe it? Unbelievable. He's even worked with your buddy, Michael Greif. That's right. Oh, we'll get into that. Yes, and speaking of Mendez, you can also find Ryan and Lindsay teaching aspiring actors in NYC with their program, Actor Therapy. He is a Jonathan Larson Grant recipient, a Richard Rogers Award winner. We grew up together. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Ryan Scott Oliver. Yay. Hi, guys. How are you? It's so good to see you, Ryan, in your lovely new house. Our lovely new house. We're in Beacon, New York. We just Yay. moved uh, for the holidays, and we are loving it. Oh, it's Incredible. like the perfect time to get out of the city during uh, ye old COVID and everything. It's no, it's real. We it was time. We were just like you know the the city is such a magical place as both of you know. Um, but I think that during the pandemic, you know the magic, the excitement, the hope, the wonder just sort of drains out, and <laughs> the magic and the excitement now is upstate New York. Yay! And it's blanketed in snow right now. It's like a it's like a postcard. Yeah. Yeah, it we've really got is. we've got something like sixty degrees right now yeah. and sunny out, outside our windows, so we're doing okay. So bummed um, out. There's no so, snow at all. <laughs> so uh, Ryan is uh, married to uh, our last interviewee, Matthew Murphy. So that's who he's talking about there. So Ryan, I just want to start from the very beginning. Um, you've written so many works, so many different things, and you know I'm lucky to have kind of been there and seen you grow over yeah. the years, which is really exciting. Oh my god. Oh my god. So. Uh, Uh, Just tell us, how did you get into this whole musical theater writing thing? You know, as as you know, but maybe our audience doesn't know, um, I my family had there was no there were no artists in my family whatsoever. Uh, You know, it was a sports family. And I just don't think art of any kind was really just on the radar. And I certainly don't think it was something that they thought would be like a lucrative career. You know, my mom was always incredibly supportive of whatever I wanted to do. but I didn't, you know, up until a certain point, I didn't really have any role models. And then um, I met you and your family and um, your mom was, was and is, you know, clinically obsessed with musical theater, <laughs> which then of course trickled down to you. And um, I think that the, ter- the turning point in terms of interest, cause you know, I wanted to hang out with my friends and, you know, a lot of the shows that we did when we were younger was like, you know, at, at at best, like a fun thing to do and at worst, like total peer pressure. But then the thing that changed that made it like, oh, I want to do this. You, I think your mom was giving you voice um, piano lessons and we were doing uh, Once Upon a Mattress. And the old, like the, the script at the back of the vocal book had, you know, the, the melody line. And it was the first time I'd really explored music. And, you know, be, because I was in the show and, you know, can, able to connect the vocal line to what I was doing, I was like, this is, it's, it's the first moment of going like, oh, this is a language I want to learn. Hmm. And so I remember, I remember like asking you like what the key signatures meant and you knew because you were doing piano lessons and all that good stuff. And I remember multiple times when like I would come over to hang out with you or Cody, your brother, and I would stay after we were done hanging out and just like play on your mom's piano. And I would like be like, I'm going to learn these notes. And it wasn't really about learning piano. It was more about like embracing the language that was music. And so that, and then the other big shift in that also related to you guys was that you, your mom ha- has, I assume she still has all of these Broadway musicals on record. Oh, she gave and them all to me. I have a huge box of them amazing. now. They're all here and they have all the same skips that I remember from when oh, we wow. were young, like where I would ch- put them on cassette tape so we could listen yes, to all of them. Yes, she knows them so well she can call when the skip is about to happen. She's like, oh, this there's about to be a skip. It's incredible. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I mean, that was it. It was you, I, I, you were so kind and so willing to like probably 40 
40 cast albums on cassette for me. And that is like, that was like the bedrock of how I learned musicals. And then I think by the time we were in high school, um, I think I gave you a break and I was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I started picking up the Sondheim albums and that became the Sondheim scores. And um, between all of that, it was, you know, my love for musical theater. And I think a lot of Broadway kids get very possessive of the art form. And because you can collect, it's like you can collect the work of Sondheim. You can collect, if you're that kind of person, the work of Angela Weber, the work of Jerry Herman. You can collect all the musicals from a certain time period or whatever. And so it's very, it becomes very easy and very affordable um, and very accessible to, to, to do that. And, and that is what sort of started everything. Wow, that's really cool, man. You know, I, I, I found, I just in moving, I found my Once Upon a Mattress script from that production. And it has oh, all wow. of the notes and all the cuts and like everything written in my like 14 year old handwriting. Oh, no. So we went to the LA County High School for the Arts um, and we did some shows there. Uh, it's always fun to tell people that our high school production of Fiddler is on YouTube. Um, That's right. <laughs> it was on the Tony Awards at one point. Well, who, who were you in that? Was Ryan? I was Perch. He was Perch. Of course he was Perch. And Ryan hated the, it. The he hated the dancing. He was know, good at Perch. Well, I mean, he ends up in Siberia or something. Spoiler alert. He gets the song yeah. that ends on the weird note. He doesn't end there. It's a great part. I would have loved to have seen you in that. You, well, you can at any point. Emily will Emily will gladly show you wow. the wedding dance. I can't believe I, all yeah. these years. All these years, I haven't checked it out. I, I will know. definitely do that. So, so you went. We went to Loxa, and then um, what was your higher education like after high school? Well, when we were at Loxa, you know, I wrote. I had written like literally one song. You know, I think in seventh grade, and then in 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 eleventh grade of high school, um, which sets up the higher education situation, uh, I was we were doing in an English class. We were tasked with um, uh, adapting the work of Edgar Allan Poe in our varied art form, and so I, you know, I was in a super Sondheim phase, and <laughs> so I wrote this like extraordinarily dense and pattery lyric to the Telltale Heart. And I was super proud of it. And I was like, this is the most fun I've ever had. And then I was, and at that point I, you know, I, I had acquired enough musical knowledge and music theory knowledge. I was good at music theory, even though I wasn't a great pianist, but I was good at music theory. And I just sort of put all that together and I started working on a musical of the crucible, which I thought and still think is a great idea. Um, and uh, so that, so when we, you know, I was at LOXA like you as a vocal performance major because there was no, I don't think there was a composition major. No. And leaving there, I applied to some schools, and I applied to some schools for voice, and I applied to some schools for composition. And I sort of let fate be my guide. Um, and I ended up going to UCLA partly because I was young-ish, you know, because I'm a Virgo and my birthday sucks. And I, so I was so young to go to college that I was afraid to leave home. Well, you skipped a grade too, thank you very much. I did. I skipped. I skipped a. I skipped a random grade, which was you skipped so, eighth grade. So silly. I did. I skipped, I skipped eighth grade. Yeah. So he and um, my brother were the same year, and then all of a sudden Ryan was a year in between me and Cody. I'm be- I, I've never heard of anybody skipping the eighth grade. Well, I, you shouldn't because that's when you learn. <laughs> that's when you learn about American history. So, like for the longest time, like, and also we had a, a delightful American history teacher at Loxa who I will not name, even though he is so delightful, but because of what I'm about to say. And his tests were multiple choice. And I would, instead of learning any of the material, I would, because he would give us the test in advance, I would just memorize B, C, C, yeah. B, A, D. For every test, I would pass every test. And literally when the AP test came, I got a one. And you you have to basically write your name on the test and do nothing more in order to get a one. Like. <laughs> It's, it's practically unheard of. So that's how much I, and then of course, you know, I, I ended up becoming obsessed with American history in my writing life. And so now I like, I caught up, but anyway, so don't skip eighth grade. <laughs> yeah. Um, Spectacular. So I ended up going to, I ended up going to UCLA for music composition, um, you know, for a, a variety of reasons, but one, I just think I wasn't ready to leave home. I did UCLA for the four years, you know, had a very lovely time. Um, part, part of, on one hand, it was, it was not the most ideal situation because state doing stage music was really not something anybody was doing at UCLA. Hmm. The good part of that was that I could get the attention I wanted and I could have the opportunities I wanted because no one else was asking for those opportunities. Yeah. Um, and then I went to NYU for graduate musical theater writing. I was finally ready to 
leave. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's how I made my way to New York. And uh, the NYU grad musical theater writing program, I remember at the time it was the only program like that in mm-hmm. the country. Is it still the only one? I, I, I am doubtful that it is, but I'm, sh- but I can say that it is the most prestigious and the most, uh, has it shit together, I guess, uh, program. There are others that I think, I think other schools have done minors and, and it's really not geared toward, it's like more like an offering for other graduates or undergraduates, um, as far as I know, but I, I could certainly be wrong. You said something really cool that I've never quite heard phrased this way. You said you were sort of finding um, the art of music or what did you just said? Some finding the language of music you said, yeah. which is really, yeah. really interesting in your case, like writing musical theater scores and shows and songs. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your process because your, your writing is so different from anyone else that I've ever really heard. You like just within one song, you can go, you go so many places. They're like, their own little opuses within themselves. You like, get, you get like when you when you look at Ryan's uh, describers online, it's always very like high gothic horror fantasy, but then mixed in with like queer pop sensibilities. So, but he, but which even, is kind of um, knowing you my whole life. That's kind of who you are, like in a nutshell. For sure, the the song moment is always going to dictate what it should be, you know, and. I'm definitely, I rarely, when I was, when I started out, I would write a full lyric and then I would set it to music. And that, has, it's been a long time since, since that's been the way. I mean, mm-hmm. if, if the song is like a uh, super intimate, super character driven, maybe poetic uh, uh, kind of song, the like we, like we would see in like Stay With Me from Into the Woods, like a moment like that. Um, I'm going to write the lyric first because I want the language and I want the lyric to to dictate everything else that comes after it. If it's something super groovy, super fun, it's like it's going to be one of the ones you hope is a hit from the show. It's very buoyant, energetic. I'm going to definitely discover the sound world, the groove, the tempo, the chord progression, and just get a feel for it. And then I'm going to write a lyric that sort of works within that. And um, I'm big on research. I mean, so much of my process that I think has has helped me is that I spend a lot of time getting ideas before I sit down. And, you know, when I say that I never get writer's block, that's not because I'm particularly good or special. It's because of the research. I think too many, you know, they say that, that um, creativity comes from three places, either experience, imagination, or research. And musical theater, because it is such an accessible and presumably unacademic art form, right? Um, seemingly people think it's an unacademic right. art form. Uh, they, they, writers most of the time write from experience. And that's why so much of their work sucks because we don't, I think you have to include your experience, but when you only include your experience that, you know, unless you're like a monk who has like spent a lot of time thinking, or you're an expert on the particular thing you're talking about, your chance, chances are you're not going to like write the most profound thing. But once you combine that with your creativity through your imagination and you combine that with research, that is where the magic is. That is where the gold is. And I mean, Emily, you're in grad school for musical theater history, right? Yes, I am. I I imagine that you, (laughs) there are moments in your life these days where you're kind of like, you wish that younger musical theater people knew their history and could understand how current musicals, you know, relate to old musicals. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, like it's, it's just, there, there are like YouTubers who make whole careers out and podcasts out of talking about musicals who don't even know like why we care about Oklahoma, you know, like the basic ass stuff that like you should know. Um, And it's so funny when people dismiss older musicals without thinking about them in their historical context or why we might still do them with high schoolers or any of that stuff. So it's an easy joke and it's an old trope, you know, old things are worthless. It's, it's total nonsense. Um, I wanted to go back to um, NYU a little bit because I wanted to know, um, did was your experience there valuable? I mean, I imagine you got a lot of the a lot of that, I guess, structure that you needed or made. Con- I know the connections you made there are right, still right. they're still holding today. Like so many of right. those people are still, I know, around or at least in your circle. Um, can you just right. talk about that a little bit? I'm so grateful that the NYU program was there because I was so 
it's weird, you know, I think those of us who grow up in large cities like Los Angeles or Chicago or Seattle, I think there's a huge temptation to never leave because you sort of have everything you'd ever want from a quote unquote big city right there. And I don't think I ever would have, I don't, I think it would have taken, I would have delayed two, three or four years if there hadn't been the grad program. What I discovered though is interesting. It's like, if you, if you're going to go to graduate school for law or for medicine, of course, of course you're prepared and of course you are primed, but you're going to get there and they're going to kind of teach you everything mm. that you need to know. But what's interesting about musical theater grad school is that it, the same rule applies, but when you're a theater queen and you have s devoted so much of your life to this, you can learn a lot of what you, you're going to learn there before you get there. And so I, I, I think when I got to the program as one of the composer lyricists, I think that I felt, and, and I, a, group, a large group of us, you know, with similar interests and histories to me, felt like, like, oh, you know, we were sort of waiting for other people um, who were coming at this for the first time to sort of catch up. But on the other hand, mm. I will say, I was approaching, you know, a lot of us, you know, who had had more experience already came into this being like, there's a formula, right? And, and, and here are the marks we're supposed to hit. And I think a lot of my peers who came at this totally fresh were able to bring an originality and a perspective that we didn't have hmm. which and I could only really appreciate that you know after I'd left I think the biggest thing that I that I got there in addition to meeting so many incredible teachers the, the teachers were really the big thing that you know you had you had you had faculty who were you know themselves trying to make their way on Broadway and then you had other faculty members who had had Broadway shows already and, you know, some faculty were tough love and like, this is the industry and this is what this is what it is. And there were other faculty who were nurturers. And I think getting that sort of wash in the field was really exciting to me. Um, hmm. It was also the first time that I had, you know, reference for kind of how I was doing and what I was doing. And up until I went to NYU, I was writing fairly avant-garde kind of quasi opera quasi strange musical which isn't to say that i never i it, my work was definitely like not commercial and what was interesting is that when i got to nyu and this was the time when paskin paul and latter milk and kerrigan and joy iconis were literally starting they had you know their name had just come on the scene yeah. within the last year or two from me getting there and i was like oh they're writing rock they're writing pop they're writing pop cabaret um it was the first time I was like, oh, I, I think that if I'm going to be competitive, I need to learn to do this. So I was also able to use the program to cut my teeth on those art forms so much so that by the time I left, everyone was like, oh, Ryan Scott Oliver does rock and pop. And they had no idea that I was like writing The Crucible, the musical. <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was kind of the same as you learning about musicals, except I was doing that in college. Like sure. it was this kind of whole new He's thing. He's that typical straight boy who well, just like didn't, who got into it in college and then ended up being like perfect at it. You know? Right. Oh, uh, thanks. Um, but I feel like what I, what I find so impressive about your style is it's so bold and it, and it, like it had to take real sort of artistic conviction and uh, tenacity really to, to, to do, to write the way you write. How did you find the courage to, to be different from, from the other writers out there? Well, I mean, what's actually interesting is that I had up to that point, oh, I had been different. And so yeah. what I was more doing for those two years was sort of going like, oh, this is the race that we're all supposed to be running. Yeah. And so I'm going to learn how to run that race. But at the same time, it's like, though I was doing rock and pop, you know, my thesis musical at NYU was a show called Mrs. Sharp, which was based on the, the Pamela Smart, you know, teacher student sex scandal and murder trial because she seduced her student into murdering her husband. And, you know, no one, you know, back in the day, it was like the big court case of like the century right before OJ. And then OJ mm -hmm. sort of like washed the whole thing away. Um, and what was, you know, for me, it was the first moment, by the time I got to the end of the program, I was like, I know how to write rock. I know how to write pop. I know how to do all of this. But I also still have all of these roots in sort of strange -er music and, and to push the boundary and to you know, open our mind. And so getting to write a piece about uh, uh, an incredibly motivated woman who also, you know, has a certain level of sociopathy, you know, she's kind of a psychopath, you know, the getting to enter her world in that way um, and her delusion 
you know, was a sort of the perfect marriage. I mean, you're Emily, you're wearing the Jasper Deadland shirt, similar situation in, with that, you know, it's a rock and pop show, but the whole thing takes place in the afterlife. So again, I don't get as excited about writing contemporary rock and pop music, you know, a la the evolutionary of the Schwartz, et cetera. If it, there isn't an element that I feel like I'm the one to bring the thing to life. That's amazing. And like, I was just thinking like, um, thinking about those people like Joey Connors and Pasek and Paul and Kerrigan and Loudermilk, like all of you guys are, I feel like this new generation of um, musical theater composers that very much got a leg up in the cabaret scene. Like I feel like the cabaret scene is just, yeah. has blown up kind of in the past yeah decade maybe two decades yeah. um and that's how a lot of young composers are getting their work across and i know that's kind of how you got snowballing a little yeah. bit like you had a bunch of cabarets in new york and then obviously in la as well what's interesting is that i would actually say i think that's true but i would actually i would interpret it more as youtube was mm. really the thing that that yeah. changed everything because if if there if, if, it, if there hadn't been youtube i don't know that i ever would have really found my footing because I'm a, a, a very decent performer, but I'm a terrible pianist. And I don't know if I were to, so back in the day, pre-YouTube, for, for our audience. Yes, you, children, you yeah. <laughs> Pre-YouTube, I mean, the way, the way that Stephen Schwartz and Jason Robert Brown and everybody got their work heard was ha you know presenting their original work in cabaret spaces you know in the west village in midtown and having which is a place that professionals who could make moves happen would attend you know after shows have a couple of drinks it was part of the community and then it would be like oh who's this up and coming writer they seem very very talented i'm going to you know you know push them along and if that had been what was expected of me, I don't think I would have caught on as quickly as I did because I just, I don't think that my package would have sold there. Mm. But what, what I did have was that I'm a good orchestrator. I'm a good leader. I'm a good director. I'm a good, I'm a good producer. And so when I was given the opportunity to create these concerts at places like Joe's pub and the duplex and later 54 below and could film them, I, you know, I was among a generation of those artists, and then I would add Nick Blameyer and Adam Guan and um, several others, who who were the first to really be like the the sort of a who's who. And what's interesting is that you know I think we still see this type of thing continue. Right now, we're dealing with it with uh, TikTok, yeah. and we're dealing with the Bridgerton musical and the various other musicals that are being written via TikTok. And those artists are very likely. Um, going to be the artists that we are all following for the next several years. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's like necessity is the mother of invention. It's like we couldn't, yeah. COVID happened and we couldn't do live performances anymore. Right. So all these kids who are savvy with that stuff, like just yeah. did it. It's it's 100%. crazy. Well, it really is an exciting new way of writing a show. It's something that, you know, it's unprecedented. Just like, you, just like YouTube was when it first came out. Like, like when I first moved to the city, it was, you know, before YouTube, uh, but there were there was like you know I was taking auditioning classes and I remember like Craig Carnelia had these songs that were yeah. were not a part of a musical and and like yeah. I'm sure nobody does this anymore but Taylor the Latte Boy was a big old audition song for a long time. So what would you say was like your first like big break moment? Like um, I could probably guess a few, but like what would you say it would be? I mean I think the first time that I really felt like I had reached a, a, a point. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate because I think that, you know, when I graduated NYU at, in 2007, I think over the next like three or four years, you know, things moved pretty quickly. And, you know, even at the time I was like, oh my God, I'm moving so slowly. But in retrospect, you know, that's when my major awards were won and that's when a lot of my big opportunities began. Um, I think I would say like the big turning point that made me feel super cool was that um, we won, my collaborator Kirsten Gunther and I won the Richard Rogers Award. Um, and that entitled us to a reading. And that reading ended up being at Playwrights Horizons. Michael Greif directed it and uh, Jane Krakowski uh, uh, starred in it as this, the, the teacher that I previously mentioned. And Mrs. Uh, Sharp, right? As Mrs. Sharp, and yes. And wasn't yes, yes. Allie Stroker in that? She was, she was. In fact, she was in a ton of our development. You know, she, she, she and Alex Brightman had done the show at NYU um, wow. as students. 
I just remember you at the time being like, we cast this girl and she's really amazing and she's yeah. in a wheelchair, but like the character's not in a wheelchair, but it doesn't really matter. So she's just really good. And like- that's... Well, and then we made her in a wheelchair. Like now the character will always be in a wheelchair. Wow. Allie, Allie just really opened our minds. You know, it's, 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 it's 2021 and it's, 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 we're at such a different time in terms of really understanding what real equitable casting is. And also as writers understanding that like, I think in the past, a lot of us, you know, wrote characters of privilege, whether that was because we were afraid to write away from that, especially if we were people of privilege, um, or if that's all we knew. And I think that that was a moment in a many ways, um, and especially getting to work with, with a disabled actress and learn so much about what that experience was. I don't, I really think I took it for granted at the time, but it, you know, it forged a, uh, my relationship with Ali and you know, it's, I'm, I remain really proud. Let's, let's talk about your show. So wait, I, I, was Mrs. Sharp the one that was on The Apprentice? No, that was actually dark. So Mrs. Sharp <laughs> was how we got invited on The Apprentice, but then the, 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 the challenge changed. And so Kirsten and I were invited to basically each pitch a different musical. So oh, I pitched yes. Darling and she pitched a musical called Little Miss Fix It. Which I was in one of the first yes. readings of at NYU. You were. You I was were. Little Miss Fix It. Spectacular. Yes. That's so funny. I'd forgotten about that. Anyway, keep going. Keep going. No, no. And so and so there was that. We we never met Donald Trump. Um, Thank God. And it was like the 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 world of reality television was alive and well. It was so it was such a bizarre such a bizarre experience, but but a, a fun fact to share at parties. Oh, let's talk about 35 millimeter. That's one that yeah. you've had going for a while. Um, we yeah. love that show, obviously. And, you know, we were in the L.A. premiere of it. And um, yeah. tell us how that show came to be. I was at a part of my life where Mrs. Sharp and Darling were both in development and had, a, you know, I had always heard that like musicals take six years to like get to Broadway and like that was fine. But I was very impatient and I was so anxious to have a cast recording and to have vocal selections and like all those, you know, very materialistic things that us writers want to have. And I, you know, saw Matt's incredible work. I thought that he was such an incredible artist. And I, you know, I had the idea that at the time I felt like I was just like stealing from Sunny in the Park with George and like people would roll their eyes. But then like, I feel like people seem to think that it's like a unique idea. Who who knows? Who cares? Um, it happened. Uh, we we wrote the thing. Um, you know, I wrote a series of songs based on his photographs, and um, you know, it was an example. It truly was an example of like, you, there. Yes, musical theater is like one of the most collaborative art forms out there, but on the other hand, you know, especially when that collaboration includes producers and investors and oftentimes theaters, there are so many gatekeepers that keep your show behind, you know, close, four walls, essentially. Um, that to have a moment where you want to collaborate with, with this, a group of people who have the same mission as you do, is, is some, it, there's merit to that. And that is what 35 millimeter was about. And so we put the thing up. It only ran for three performances. That's all we, we did it at this bizarre, like, bizarre theater space called the Galapagos art space where Matt and I would later get married. They got married and, there. Yeah. And, uh, and the show, the show has really been the gift that keeps on giving, you know, it, I owe so much of my life um, and bank account to that show. <laughs> it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a, it's a really incredible piece that I did not anticipate would, uh, would do what it has done. Oh, it's got the perfect um, regional uh, college community theater afterlife cabaret because you can do it anywhere. Um, right. And obviously yeah. it's been done all over the world. Um, I know there was like a big production in London um, that you guys saw and it's it's just very accessible. And a lot of the songs just stand on their own too. So yeah, um, it's, it feels it's like every, every song is its own story. It's a really yeah. wonderful project to work on. I, I, can we talk a little bit about, uh, like you mentioned collaboration. Uh, so working with the director and the music director and producers and stuff, like how did you kind of na navigate those waters? Well, what's interesting is that I, with a show like this, y you're only really concerned, like, is the song good? And at that point I had, I had figured out how to make a, a song good. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and then the second part of it is like order of the show and transitions. And 
I think that I, I, to be honest with you, I think that I, I went in there with such confidence that I was able to, to put something together effectively. That isn't to say that things didn't change and things didn't get revised. I mean, a lot of those songs would, would be put out there and revision would happen, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot, that's a way that a lot of the development occurred. We ended up the, ori the original, you know, initially we were working with um, Daisy Prince who directed Songs from the World, was mm -hmm. the very first director on the piece. And she was such an incredible mentor and so informative for what this piece could be. And she, much like Jason's work, much like her work on Jason's work, was, it was an approach of, a lot of directors approach musicals, and, and this is fair, with, with an eye that like, the story sucks, the book sucks, we got to change it, da 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 And I think that there, you know, there's a song in 35 millimeter called, you know, Why Must We Tell Them Why? And, you know, one of the, one of the big lyrics in it is, you know, it, it is what it is and it is what it ought to be. It is what it is and it is what it's got to be. It is what it is and it is. And, you know, in, in musical theater is one of the only art forms where you can make something and be educated and inspired and motivated and make something. And you have to get 20 other people to say yes. If you're writing a novel, if you're writing even a lot of plays, if you're writing, uh, if, you're, if you're painting something, if you're sculpting something, you do the thing and you put it out there and people either like it or they don't like it. But you did the thing and you move on. And I do think musical theater would benefit more because all these great pieces like the Spring Awakenings and the In the Heights and the Hamiltons and, and a lot, so many, and the Next to Normals, so many of the musicals that we all know and love occurred because two people weren't paid to write it. They got the idea. They said, I want to do this. And they did the thing. Um, you know, that is, that is, re and I mean, Dear Evan Hansen, I mean, I remember being at the Dramatist Guild Fellowship in 2007 with Benj and Justin and Pascal Paul, and they had the idea there, you know, they didn't have the name for it, but I remember, and I remember thinking to myself, like, hmm, this doesn't seem like the greatest idea for a musical. Um, <laughs> but it was, obviously it was. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, again, people with ideas, writers with ideas that don't have to get the approval of producers and so to me that is how the best art gets made 35 millimeter in terms of the collaboration was working with people who trusted me by the time we ended up working for the Galapagos thing my producer trusted me Jeremy Bloom was the director he's an, you know does a lot of uh, avant-garde theater and opera where again there's trust in the people making the thing and that to me has been you know the thing that I have found most effective in my life so we mentioned um Mrs. Sharp, uh, we mentioned Darling, which I guess we should maybe talk about a little bit more just because I love Skip Darling. Skip past that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, let's talk about Jasper and Deadland, um, which, you know, I'm wearing my Jasper shirt. Thank you very much. Um, which had an amazing trajectory from, uh, you know, our summer Pasadena musical theater yes. program to off yes. Broadway. Um, and, I, you know, I like to call it, it's like Hades Town, but YA. Um, yes, <laughs> it, it's the Hades Town for the teens, which I think is great and wonderful and accessible because it originally was performed by teens in the first yes. draft. So, um, yes. talk a little bit of, about Jasper. Um, well, I mean, it was it was written for teenagers. You know, we we were our company, the Pasadena Musical Theater Program, was you know I think we were at a point where we had been doing musical reviews, which were mm -hmm. amazing, um, but I think there was an interest in doing something original. Um, partly as an investment, um, which did end up serving the company. And, and I knew that we had had, we, you know, th that the year that Jasper was written, we had an, a lot of boys, you know, an uncharacteristic so rare. amount of boys. It's like yeah, a unicorn sure. when that happens. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, well, I'm going to do an adaptation. And I thought about like Jack and the Beanstalk. I thought about like Hercules. I thought about, you know, these pieces. And I eventually settled on, you know, my love of Greek mythology and the Orpheus myth. Um, and uh, and then Jasper was born. We you know we did it uh, with the high school students. It was definitely a moment where like it was like a very very expensive high school show, and everyone was kind of like, "Cool, that's a lot." Um, and uh, crazy and, puppets and oh yeah. my god. And years, a couple years later, uh, a, a company called Prospect Theater Company, is an incredible company in New York City, uh, you know, was looking through my stuff and they said, "We want to do the show." We did it. Um, and it was a scrappy little thing. It was a scrappy little thing in an off-Broadway off, off space in an attic of a church. It was a blast to do. No one had any expectations other than knowing that, that I and, and the director and the incredible group of actors 
we're all making our way, all, you know, we're talented. And that's how people approached it. And they loved it for that reason. You've had your last few things um, I want you to talk about a little bit because I know you had um, a series, I think it's like a trio of albums, um, we, we Foxes, Rope, and then Three Points of Contact, which I, th yep. I think are supposed to be all connected kind of, or like they're variations on it. It's very Michael Cunningham. Sure, yes. <laughs> and then your most recent um, album, which came out in October, was uh, Future Demons, which I, I think oh, is yeah. pretty great. So um, just, I don't know, talk about any and all of those wonderful sure. albums. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, We Foxes is a piece that it was, the, you know, it was a turning point in my career. You know, I think prior to that, I was writing for, quote unquote, the man. I was writing, you know, I was always writing with an eye for commercial theater and an eye for what people wanted. And We Foxes was a huge turning point for me because it was a commission, but the commission assignment was like, write the thing that no one else will let you write. And that was the perfect assignment for that. Um, and that's sort of like my Southern Gothic meets Sweeney Todd musical. Um, there's an EP out there. It just was really, frankly, a demo. It's just like a demo. Keep your eyes peeled. Stuff is happening. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Um, the... <laughs> Uh, the, the musical formerly known as Rope is now called Tethered, and I'm actually working mm. on that with um, uh, uh, actor um, Adam Chandler Bratt, who people know from Next to Normal and know from um, Peter and the Starcatcher. Yeah. Um, and he's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We're working on that, doing a total revision. Very excited about that. And then Three Points of Contact, you know, it was a piece that I wanted you know, it was part like a desire to, to return to my like kind of pop rock roots, but also just like it was, I had it was, it's the only piece I've ever written that is contemporary that doesn't have like some kind of like mystical, magical death element. Right. Um, it's also kind of like a, a sexy show. It's a show about very adult themes. Um, and it's a piece that once the album sort of came out, I got sort of whisked away to a couple of other things. And I'm very excited to return to at some point in the future. So Future Demons was a project that, you know, much like 35 Millimeter, much like Jasper and Deadland, came from the opportunity, which is that the pandemic started. And I had been, you know, I had read Shirley's work for We Foxes, and I had been obsessed with Shirley's work for a very long time. You know, was very into The Haunting of Hill House that happened on, you know, was remade on Netflix. Yes. And on a whim, I just started going back through her stories, and I contacted her estate, and they were like, sure, whatever, <laughs> do it. Um, and, uh, and so I wrote these five songs that are on an album called Future Demons. I intend, and I think it will work out, that every October for the next two years, I'll probably release five to seven more of these stories and they'll become like a theater piece or they won't. Um, you know, to me, making these was just the fun of making them. Um, yeah. you, know, it's, and that, you know, that's the thing is that I think sometimes you just have to make things. You have to, you have to paint your painting, hang it up and then move on. It's tr Aww. truly inspiring. And you make a cameo, I noticed, in, in Future I do. Demons. Yes. <laughs> on a song called What a Thought. Yes, I, I play the... The husband who who gets killed. Yes. Well, wait, so were there have there been any other cameos on any of your records? He was all mm -hmm. over his first album from when we were in like oh, yes. high school uh, and college yes. and stuff. He's all over him. Sweet. On the later <laughs> stuff, on the later stuff, I think I do a duet with Lindsay Mendes on um, Three Points of Contact, and then I'm in the ensemble. I'm always in the ensemble. I save a lot of money that way. Uh, I'll I'll sing the tenor line. I'll sing the bass line. I'll bury myself. No one cares. So smart. <laughs> so smart. So what are you working on now? Like, what are the next big projects that are coming up for you? Because I heard that you've got some really exciting things like in the pipeline or, you know, were happening before ye old COVID happened. Sure. Um, tell us what's coming up next for RSO. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing I've, I've gotten to work on over the last couple of years is a musical called Hugo, which is based on the invention of Hugo Cabret, which is an incredible, incredible novel by Brian Selznick. And there was the um, movie. And then, and then Scorsese made a film of it in... 2011 and um you know it was it's it's just really been the honor of my life you know working to christopher wilden uh, who comes from the world of 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 ballet and and modern dance is the director and he's just an incredible dramaturg so right for musical theater and then getting to work with brian uh, selznick the original novelist is the book writer and truly truly the best collaboration i've ever had um we've been working on it in london our producers um, recently produced Anne Juliet, which, by the way, Emily, if you don't know Anne Juliet, do you know this musical? Uh, I, I, I've heard of Anne Juliet. It's going but... to be, it's truly going to be your next obsession. Like, I, I, <laughs> if you like Six, it's like, it's like so stupid and so good. Anyway, so they, they, they produced that and, and um, you know, so the, the, the London, we're really excited about sort of the next steps with Hugo. Obviously, nothing can really happen until the world resumes. <laughs> um, 
And the other two fun things that I'm working on, one is actually, I'm glad you brought up 35 millimeter and I've re recently gotten to answer these, but we're basically creating an album of commentary that breaks down every single track in that show, plus interviews with the cast, you know, song analysis, behind the scenes stories, the origin of these songs. So if anybody's a fan of this, um, pick your favorite song. You'll listen to a track seven minutes later. You know everything there's possibly to know about that song. I love that. Song. Well, I and that's fantastic because that. again, like that. So all the original cast is yeah. going to do it. So okay, yeah. so so if you guys don't know, that's Ben Crawford who was like the Phantom, I think last, right? Yes. Um, yeah. then Alex Brightman, Lindsay Mendez, uh, Betsy Wolf, and uh, Jay. Armstrong, Armstrong Johnson. Johnson, yeah, who that's are right. all like big, huge things now. So yes. that sounds yes. like that would be like a musical theater nerd. Like, it's dream. fun. It's fun. I mean, they, they, we dish. We all dish, and it, it is fun. I like my favorite thing in the world was bleeping them. Uh, like when they would when they would say a bad word, and then I'd get to bleep them. That's like really fun. <laughs> Basically, between between tethered and this album and Hugo and We Foxes and all that good stuff, the the play. Oh, oh, uh, there's a movie from 1991 called Heart and Souls, which um, it was a Robert Downey Jr. I remember that movie. Yeah, yeah. Heck yeah. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a cult classic. Um, and uh, my husband really loved it. And, and he, anyway, Kirsten Gunther that I uh, wrote Mrs. Sharp with, she and I are working on a musical adaptation on it. We actually got commissioned to do it like two years ago. And like, we were just about to start it when the pandemic started. We can start at any time. We're just, we're, 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 we need to, we need to, we need to get to work on it. We're, we're going to get to work on it. I'm wow. just happy that you and Kirsten are still like writing together. That just makes me really oh, yeah. happy. Well, yeah. I, I was just about to say like all the things you're working on, you wouldn't have time, but then of course you do have another project. Sure. Well, and then sure. then let's t just I want to touch on like kind of your day job, uh, which yeah. is actor therapy. Um, yeah. Can you talk yeah. about actor therapy a little bit? Yeah, actor therapy is honestly it's been it's been a real uh, lifesaver. I mean, you know, with especially with the day to day, you know, a lot like, for example, a lot of my income last year or the last couple of years has come from this cruise ship show that I wrote. And, you know, you, you develop a certain level of comfort being like, ah, you know, the, the ship's still at sea. So. <laughs> I'm all right. I, yeah. So I'm all right. And so when when the ship got docked, uh, you know, uh, th that and and so many other things, you know, just the so many of my commissions are based on, you know, you get paid a little bit at the front and then you get paid when the first reading happens or you get paid, frankly, like when it happens. And mm -hmm. so if it's not happening, you know, a lot of that money gets delayed. So actor therapy has been a true lifesaver. But the biggest thing I would say about that is that especially over the last year, especially through 2020, having a community of young artists and especially diverse artists who we've Lindsay and I have gotten to have the most incredible conversations and, and really use our institution to take action because a lot of us I know have felt really helpless um, in, in, in the wake of black lives matter, especially what's happening to Asian artists of late um, feel really helpless in, 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 in taking action beyond a social media post or the donations that we can make. And so getting to have a platform where we can scholarship students, where we can raise our voices, where we can collect voices, where we can have interviews and masterclasses and, and put into action making our student base, making our faculty truly equitable, not just diverse. Um, it, and I mean this, it is, it is, it is, really changed my life and and made me aware of so much privilege that I as a white man have have benefited from and getting to have a place where I can take a back seat is a good is has is, has been really formative for me of late and and I I love actor therapy that's so awesome. Um, I just wanted to bring up, just because I think this is kind of a fun symmetry for our lives. So for all of you folks out there, um, Ryan and I used to have this tradition for like a few years in our 20s where we would go on some kind of trip to go see yeah. a Sondheim production. So yeah. we went to DC to see the Sondheim celebration at the Kennedy Center. Um, and uh, we went to... Um, uh, Chicago to go see Bounce, Bounce. Okay, it's about basketball. Um, so it was a really right? no, it's not. Right. Um, it, it it was it was a big thing in our lives, and it, we you know because we were just Sondheim jerks, we were just those those kids. Um, <laughs> For sure. But For sure. Um, I know that you you met him at one point, right? Yeah, tw uh, so we met him met him once. Uh, breathed the same air as him a couple of times, but. Uh, the, when we want, when you win the Richard Rogers Award, 
you uh, get lunch for Sondheim. Like that's one of the things you get. And so uh, myself and, and uh, the other several uh, artists, uh, there were like six of us that won, um, Kirsten being one of them. Um, we all got to have lunch with them. And it just so happened that at the circular table, my seat was next to his. Oh. So I, I, of course, you know, couldn't, couldn't turn down the opportunity to, to talk his ear off for the next, you know, hour and a half. And then I just want to say one other, there was just one other moment in my life when I, when I thought it was so surreal. And I don't remember those circumstances why, but I remember it was a Thanksgiving and you texted me out of the blue and you were like, I'm having Thanksgiving at Cameron McIntosh's house. Oh my God. Oh my, I haven't thought about that in a while. Yeah, it was like, that must have been five years ago. Matt was, Matt had been, I mean, Matt, Matt, Matt has shot Lemes, uh, Miss Saigon, and Phantom of the Opera for a really long time. And he has, you know, the, 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 the team that is the Cameron McIntosh team has become really great friends of ours. And that particular year, I think Phantom, I think, was opening in Rhode Island. And so Matt was there. And it sort of straddled Thanksgiving. And so I had the option to sort of like do my own thing or come to Rhode Island and be with him. And of course, I would never turn that down. Mm. And we all took a bus um, to this, I think it was a house or something <laughs> in like, it was like an hour and a half away from the theater in Providence. And we all had Thanksgiving. There was like 30 people there, but it was a Cameron McIntosh sponsored event. It was amazing. A Cameron McIntosh joint. Cam, um, yeah. call, that's Cam, fantastic. I just love, I don't know. I just love those stories. Yeah. I always, I always remember them. Um, all right. So the time has come, everyone. The time has come for us to ask Ryan the, the questions we ask everyone here on Stealing Focus interviews. The Stealing Focus Five. All right. Yay. So these, you know, these aren't the most important questions in the world, but they're the most inqu- important questions to us. So, <laughs> um, so Ryan, what is your favorite musical? Sweeney Todd, for sure. I knew you were going to say Boom. That. And that's all that needs to be said. He doesn't even need to qualify it. You don't need it. Nope. No, no need. No. Next okay. question. Okay. So what is your dream project or dream show or dream role? Just a dream thing you want to do? Well, I'll selfishly say I, my show We Foxes is, is, is my dream show. I would, I'll live and die by it. If that show gets to Broadway, I'll die happy. But if it was to be something else, uh, I would really die to write a Stephen King musical. Honestly, I'm happy to rewrite Carrie. Um, or I would, <laughs> I would write It the Musical. I think It the Musical could be his- amazing. Like, yeah. actually kind of hysterical and heartbreaking and amazing. Bravo. <laughs> that would be I great. Would you already that. have the dance. You I know, that's right. Go. That. Okay. Um, well, you might have already answered this, but okay. Question three. What project are you most proud of? Yeah, We Foxes, I think is the one I, you know, it's it's the one, not a lot, you know, it, one for every hundred people that know 35 millimeter, one person knows that 30, that, that knows about We Foxes. Um, I just, you know, it checks all my boxes. It, it is a piece that I um, am really proud of. But for those people who are more familiar with my other work, by extension, I think Leave Luann is the song that from 35 millimeter is the song that I'm most proud of um, that I've ever written. I love that song really so song. much. Oh, oh God, it's so good. Um, okay, now here we go. Uh, so no, question number four. What musical hurts your soul? So I will answer this um, in, a, in, a, in its own way. I will say that, like, first of all, I, I, and I mean this, I, knowing how difficult it is to write a show, it has really shaped the way that I review and feel about other musicals. So I actually like most things. And even if I don't enjoy it, I like go, I see what they were trying to do. I was kind of bored, but like awesome. Um, but I will say there are two songs that, that have come my way um, in the last uh, years. And I, these songs really hurt my heart in a, in a huge way. One of them, Emily, you and I have been talking about for years, which is Tell Me on a Sunday. <laughs> I think, you know, I think Andrew Lloyd Webber's music is... Take me to a is, zoo that's got chimpanzees. Andrew Lloyd Webber's music is, 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 is what it is, as totally lovely. Uh, the lyric is just really, really ineffective, I think. And the other one, actually, and I didn't know 
how much I d- really didn't enjoy it is Unexpected Song. I, 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 I don't care for it very much. I don't care for it very much. Well, you know, it's just that it's that uh, no bridge modulate, 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 kind of like how all the songs in chess are, you know, it's yeah. Like, yeah, it just kind of bit. keeps on going a little bit. Yeah, I love it, though. Um, OK, so finally, number five, who is your musical theater hero or inspiration or avatar? Just someone you look up Ooh, to. Avatar. Yeah, yeah. I'm an avatar. It's a really good question. Um, well, I'm, I'm obviously about to say Sondheim, but I, but I think we have to move past that. Um, yeah, I got this. I mean, first and foremost, first and foremost, I would say Sondheim, right? Like I think, and it's not even about like blindly going, I like Sondheim musicals. It's that for so much of his career, I would say from like company through Pacific Overtures, I, and Sweeney, I really feel like he broke ground with every single show he wrote. And I think that, you know, from his, his, the, his, the sonic world that he was operating in, his, what he held most important, you know, his values, you know, I, I aspire to work on things that are like that. And more, uh, more recently, you know, someone who doesn't necessarily write like Sondheim, but writes with, I think, the same values and someone who is, a, is a, thankfully a friend of mine and, and is someone who I really look up to still is Dave Malloy, who wrote Natasha Pierre and recently a musical called Octet. Mm, yeah. Because Dave and I are both the same kind of, uh, <laughs> we have big ideas. I think he, he, had, he has also written like a nine hour Moby Dick musical that is in like multiple acts. That's so you. Oh, for sure. And I think he, I think, at, I think at this point it, he's changed sort of what the, the scope is, but like even Octet, if, if anybody's out there who doesn't know Octet, I mean, I think it's like my favorite thing he's ever written. It's, it's, it's an incredible piece. It's, it's an acapella musical, but it is one of the smartest things I've ever written. It's, it's, it's all about the, the, the horrors of social media. And it is, it is just a truly a masterpiece. Oh, these Very are cool. such good answers. <laughs> well, I think that's it for today. Thank you, Ryan, for Thank being you, Ryan. our guest. Um, you course. were wonderful. God, you have so many great stories and advice to give. And oh, God, I can't wait to see all the new stuff that you're going to have coming out, of course. Yeah, and uh, of course. you can get Ryan's albums like all over Spotify. He's got he's got a lot of sheet music books. They all live on my shelf. I refer to them all the time. So get those sheet music books. You're going to need them when you you know do your next cabaret or something. Um, and yeah. uh, well, we really appreciate appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for continuing to push that envelope. You're making this art form even better with everything you write. It's really cool. And Ryan, why don't you tell us where you can be found on social media and the internet and whatnot? You know, thankfully I have one of those three names that like no one yell no one else has taken. So it's <laughs> Ryan Scott Oliver dot com at Ryan Scott Oliver on absolutely everything. Yeah. See, I have a thing for guys who are three named guys with Scott in the middle. Oh, so. right. That's right. That's there right. you go. Ryan's got all, over. all right. Thanks so much, Ryan. You are the best. We love you. And uh, we'll love see you, you soon. Too. Yeah. We'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get to see you in person at some point. That's yeah. right. Hopefully soon. All right. Later. Thanks for watching, everyone.